Hello class, this is Dr. Alan Branch, and today we will be discussing deontology. Deontology is one of three normative ethical theories. You will be asked to distinguish between these three theories on the midterm exam. They are deontology, virtue ethics, and teleology. So before we talk about deontology, C.S. Lewis provides us with a way of thinking about normative ethics. And it's called The Three Parts to Morality. It comes from his book, Mere Christianity. And Lewis said that if we stop and think about it, there are really three parts to morality. There are external relationships between people or groups. Then there are internal faculties. That is how we work on the inside in our, in our spirit, if you will. And then the serving proper goals, what goals or aims do we have for life? And he said these three parts to morality really represent three ways of doing ethics, three ways of thinking about ethics. And I believe Lewis's three parts to morality give us an insight into normative ethics and at least introduce to us as Christians a way of thinking about normative ethical theories. And he uses two analogies to explain the three parts to morality. The first is sailing. When you're sailing, first of all, you have to be sailing in proper formation with other ships. Of course, this painting here, this photograph here, there's only one ship. But if you're sailing with other ships, you have to follow certain rules to stay in formation. During World War II, the convoys, as they would travel across the Atlantic, had to uh, travel at a consistent speed so they wouldn't run into each other, maintain a proper distance from each ship as they're trying to avoid the German U-boats. So this is sailing in proper formation with other ships. That implies there are certain rules that we should follow when sailing with each other. But then also, if you think about it, to get there successfully, your ship has to be seaworthy. That you have to be sailing on a ship that doesn't take on water. And then finally, if you're sailing in a fleet, then there should be an agreed upon destination toward which the fleet should be headed. These really correspond to three normative ethical theories. When we talk about rules with other people, we're talking about deontology. When we talk about sailing in a ship that's seaworthy, we are really referring to virtue ethics. What's our own character like? And then the destination. What are the goals and aspirations in life? we have. Well, this corresponds to a degree with teleology. So these two analogies of sailing, the second one is really music. And he says, again, that we have to make sure we're playing at the right moment with other instruments. For example, if someone is supposed to hit the cymbals or the, the drum at a particular point in orchestral piece, it has to be done at just the right time. There are rules you have to follow for the music to sound right. But then also, you have to make sure you, your own instrument is in fact in tune or it will sound disharmonious. And then finally, what music does the conductor wish the band or the orchestra to play? And if you think about it, these again correspond to the three normative ethical theories. Playing at the right moment, there are certain rules that we must follow for a piece of music to be played appropriately. And so that corresponds to a degree with deontology. Then playing with an instrument that is in tune. This corresponds to a degree with virtue ethics. And then finally, what music does the conductor wish the band to play? What is the goal that we're trying to achieve here as a group? Well, that corresponds to teleology. So these two examples of music and sailing help us understand the three parts to morality. And these three parts to morality help us think about normative ethical theories. And again, there are three, deontology, virtue ethics, and teleology. So let's talk about deontology first of all. We'll spend most of our time here. So deontology. Deontology are theories that focus on rules and duties. If someone says to you, for example, I think murder is wrong because God says so in the Ten Commandments when he says thou shalt not murder. That person is making a deontological argument. They're arguing that a certain rule says one should not murder. The word deontology comes from two Greek words which uh, carry the idea of discourse about duty, discourse about obligation. So that's where the word comes from. 
And again, these theories address rules or duties. In deontological ethics, an action is considered morally good based on some aspect or fundamental characteristic of the action itself, and not because the consequences of the action are good. Just uh, in the next lecture, we'll be talking about teleology, and teleology is all about consequences. The most famous form of teleolo teleological ethics is utilitarianism. But deontology, it's not that deontology isn't concerned about consequences. A deontologist certainly is concerned. But the consequences in and of themselves do not determine the rightness or wrongness of an act. The, the rightness or wrongness of an act is determined by its conformity, uh, conformity to a rule or a duty that transcends the act, if you will. So perhaps the central term is ought. There are some things we ought to do and some things we ought not to do, according to a deonto deontologist. They usually focus on rules given by God. Frequently, when, when people talk about deontological theories, you get into divine command theories. However, Immanuel Kant has a reason-based form of deontology, which we'll explore in just a second. So there is a distinction with deontology I want you to know. This will be on your quiz. It will also be on your midterm. And that is the difference between act deontology and then rule deontology. Act deontology is a theory really associated with existentialist authors, someone like Jean-Paul Sartre. So according to act deontology, a moral agent should intuitively grasp the right thing to do in each specific moral situation without relying on moral rules. Somehow one self-actualizes, you're, you're faced with a transcendent moment when you must decide, and in the act of deciding, you sort of self-actualize or something. It's act deontology. If you've ever read something along the lines of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's, oh, La Peste, The Plague, or, or, um, or some of his other works, then you'll discover the idea that Really, he's, he's advocating that each situation you don't, there's no rule that tells you what to do, but you act and you choose for yourself the right act at that moment, and in the act of choosing, you somehow have established what the right thing to do is in that theory. As you might imagine, this doesn't fit with Christian ethics very well, act deontology, and frankly, it hasn't stood the test of time too well among people who think and reflect on ethics. Rule deontology is the view that types of acts are right or wrong depending on their conformity or nonconformity to one or more correct moral rules. So rule deontology accepts the concept we should appeal to principles or rules. So an act deontologist, someone who is an existentialist, is self-actualizing, if you will, in each situation, trying to find the appropriate response for any given moment that is right for that particular act. A rule deontologist says, no, there are rules that transcend all these individual moments and then we conform ourselves to those rules as best we can. So I expect you to know the difference between act deontology and rule deontology on the midterm and the quiz. Now there are some questions for deontological theories. First, what is the content of duty? Which rules direct us to morally right action? If one's going to be a deontologist, the question immediately comes, well, from whence do we get these rules? Where, from whence are they derived? Where do we get them? Well, most people are going to argue God or at least some form of reason-based conscience, if you will. But why must we follow exactly those duties and not others? So why is murder wrong as opposed to being good if it, if it helps you achieve a certain goal? So that is what grounds these rules. What validates them as moral requirements? These are serious questions. And then what is the logic of these duties or rules? Can their claims on us be delayed or defeated? Can they make conflicting claims on us? In the next module for this class, in module three, where we will discuss, in fact, what to do when it seems like you have a conflicting claims. What do you do when you have two different duties that seem to be in conflict or two rules that seem to be in conflict? It's a very in-depth question. Well. All this leads to these questions of deontological theories. If one posits that, well, the content of this duty comes from God, 
What that leads to is called the Euthyphro Dilemma. This is a very famous discussion that has existed in philosophy and theology for some time. It comes from a Platonic dialogue, Platonic-Socratic dialogue written by Plato called the Euthyphro, and in it there is a discussion, a hypothetical imaginary discussion between Socrates and some other folks, and Socrates asks Euthyphro, it's not really you thought so Socrates speaking, it's uh, Socrates is the voice of Plato here, it's a it's uh, fiction. But he asked this, is the pious being loved by the gods because it is pious, or is it pious because it is being loved by the gods? Now Plato, writing in a Greek context of polytheism, is asking this question, is some being which is pious, is it loved by the gods because it is pious? Is there something innate in this being that makes it pious good? Or is, or is it pious because it's being loved by the gods? You say, well, what does that mean? Let me explain it to you it's this way. In the modern version, here's how it gets stated. Is an act right because God says it's so, or does God say it so because it's right? Now, this goes into a problem for, for those of you who are automatically thinking, well, hey, I'm a deontologist, and I, and I argue that Christian ethics are primarily deontological. The question here is, is this act right? For example, thou shalt not murder. Is that right because God says it's right? Well, if that's the case, could God have just arbitrarily said that murder is good? Does that mean all these commands are arbitrary? Stealing, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. Could God have arbitrarily commanded something else? And what if God had said murder is good or adultery is good? Does that mean it's good? Or does God say it's, it's so because it's right? And the problem here is that you uh, would have some standard outside of God some standard of rightness or wrongness that exists outside of God. And if that is the case, then that poses a real problem for us who, for those of us who postulate that God and suggest that God is immutable, unchangeable, omnipresent, uh, omnibenevolent, omniscient, all-knowing. This challenges our, all these omnis that you learn in systematic theology. So, in modern discussion, secular people will often stress that if theist insists something is good because God says it's good, then ethics becomes completely arbitrary. God can make anything good, such as stealing lunch money from small children, simply by declaring that it's good. But on the other hand, if God declares something to be good because he is expressing a higher standard than himself, then ethics can exist without God. That's often a claim made by a modern atheist. So here's a diagram to think about it. They're trying to put you on the horns of a dilemma. If God commands X because it's right, for example, thou shalt not murder, then there's a standard of rightness independent of God, which means our suggested doctrine of this omniscient, omnipresent, all-powerful God perhaps is, is wrong. Or if X is right because God commands it, then that's the arbitrary horn. The rightness is purely arbitrary as God could command anything. Well, how do you answer the Euthyphro dilemma? It's really, really the answer is found in understanding the holiness of God. There's not two options, but three. The third option is this, that an objective standard exists. However, the standard is not external to God, but internal from God. Morality is grounded in the immutable character of God who is perfectly good. His commands are not whims but rooted in his holiness. I have a diagram here to try to show that to you. So if, if God really is loving kindness, justice, I don't have the word holiness here, but that is so central to what I'm arguing. If you have a holy God, the commands necessarily flow. It's not that the, the commands are arbitrary. God's not rolling dice in heaven. No, these commands emerge from a holy and completely good God who loves us. And then this also stresses that there's no standard outside of God, that the standard is within and intrinsic to God himself. So God issues commands based on his moral nature. This provides a non-arbitrary grounding for moral duties. And thus we can say that moral duty is in fact whatever God commands because God is good. Now let me talk to you just a second about Immanuel Kant. We're not going to spend a lot of time on Kant here. He is addressed more in more depth in philosophy here at Midwestern. But I do want to introduce you to a central idea important to Kant called the categorical imperative. It's an idea that's still used very frequently in deep 
reflection upon ethical theories, but the idea is this, act only according to that maxim by which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. So if someone's saying, for example, should I pay back my student loan debt, yes or no? Well, Kant would say, engage in this thought experiment. Well, what would happen if everyone decided I'm not going to pay back my student loan debt? Well, that would mean that banks wouldn't make their money, the governments wouldn't make money, and the student loan program would have to cease, and then if it ceased, then more people would, uh, fewer people would be able to attend college because there are not loans available to them. So therefore, yes, I should pay my student loan. I should attempt to repay my student loan. It's really a thought experiment. Let me show you, I have a crude diagram that I've drawn, and I apologize this, for the simplicity, but here's what he's dealing with. David Hume. David Hume posed what's called the is-ought problem. And David Hume said he was a, uh, really a skeptic when it comes to epistemology. Ron Nash disagrees with me to a degree on that, but that's what I think. But here's what Hume said. You can't get from an empirical is. By empirical, we mean the five senses, your taste and sense and smell. You can't get from an empirical is to a moral ought. Let me explain to you what, that, that, what, what he means by that. So let's say that you came into a classroom and saw a fellow student sitting there, let's call him John, and let's say Dr. Branch walked in and for whatever reason took a baseball bat and began to beat John all about the head. You might see John fall to the floor and bleed and, and scream out in agony. And what the average person does is they observe John in pain because he's been hit with a baseball bat. And from that, they derive this sense that we have a moral ought, a moral duty, a moral rule not to hit people about the head with a baseball bat because look at it's what's happened to poor John when it occurs. But Hume says you can't do that. Hume says all you could do is, on the empirical side is say, well, I can measure the contusions on John's head. I can see the, uh, the swelling. I can, I can evaluate how many stitches it took after he, Dr. Branch beat him with the baseball bat. That's all I can do, though. But I can't derive from all that data any moral absolute that it is bad to hit people with a baseball bat for no reason without any provocation. So he's, it's called Hume's is-ought gap. It's very, very famous. Now, in the categorical imperative, and by the way, Kant very famously said Hume awakened him from his dogmatic slumbers. So following upon Hume, Kant is is trying to deal with Hume's skepticism, but he still wants to ground ethical thinking in some sort of uh, real serious absolute even, I would say. Well, here's what he did. He uses the categorical imperative. Remember, this is a thought experiment. Act only according to that maxim by which you can at the same time will that it should have become a universal law. He's using human reason. He's trying not to use the five senses of taste and touch and smell. And so what he's doing is he's trying to use the categorical imperative to bridge Hume's is-ought gap. And he's using reason. And I want you to stress, remember, Hume says you can't get from the five senses empirically to a moral ought. So Kant's attempting not to use the five senses. Instead, he's attempting to use human reason. And so Hume would say something like this, well, what if everyone went around beating other people with baseball bats without provocation and for no reason of self-defense or something like that? Then he would say, well, I, using my thought experiment, I can reason that all sorts of negative outcomes that might come from that. And so I'm, I'm reasoning to a moral ought. On the midterm, I'm going to expect you to know this with just a simple level of understanding this is ought dilemma and how Kant is attempting to bridge that using the categorical imperative. It's a very important thought in the area of normative ethics and you should at least come out of this class with a simple understanding of it. What you discover today is that many secular people still toy around with Kant's ideas. Many of them still assume Hume is right. So when sometimes Christians make natural law arguments about right and wrong, they say, oh, they, they bring up the is-ought gap. You can't do that. And so, but in elevating human reason, that also elevates human autonomy. And biblically, we know there's a lot of problems with human autonomy. In particular, uh, R.C. Spool said, and I think he's right, that the fall was really about human autonomy. So 
I'm not going to say a lot about W.D. Ross. W.D. Ross was a very influential ethical thinker. He falls into the category of deontology. I merely want you to know the name and the key idea associated with him is prima facie duties. We will come back to these in Unit 3 when we talk about the ways or different ways people have proposed to solve moral dilemmas when it seems like you have two rules that are in conflict with each other in a particular situation. And so the prima facie duty is really means on first glance. It's just self-evident. For example, let's go back to my example. You, you're sitting in a classroom. You have a classmate named John, and Dr. Branch walks in without provocation, without any reason. I just began to beat him about the head with a baseball bat. Well, W.D. Ross would say it's just self-evident that that's wrong. You sort of intuitively know it's a prima facie duty. At, prima facie means at first glance. For example, uh, this is a horrible statement, but think about it. Is torturing babies for fun right or wrong? Well, W.D. Ross would say, prima facie, everyone just revolts at that immediately and says, well, no, you shouldn't torture babies for fun. That's wrong. It's at first glance, at just first thought, you know. So we will talk about next week the fact that for W.D. Ross, some prima facie duties can be outweighed by other prima facie duties, and what he's dealing with are situations where it seems like you have rules in conflict. What I want you to remember is the name W.D. Ross, his book was The Right and the Good, and he, he does fall in the category of deontology, and a prima facie duty, something that is self-evident, these duty, and again, you see why this is deontological. We're dealing with a duty, a duty, a rule, something we ought to do. It's just self-evident. I'm not going to talk about actual duties today, but I will say is one challenge with this theory is how can we tell which prima facie duties are involved in a particular case? It raises serious questions. How do we compare and rank them? How do we rank out? How do we decide that this prima facie duty is one, this one's number two? We'll talk about this in more depth next week. So let me say a word about, as we bring all this to, to a conclusion discussing deontology, Christian ethics are primarily deontological. Now, let me add a couple of qualifications. Christians are certainly concerned about the development of moral virtue. Christians are also concerned about the consequences of our actions. In fact, we use consequential thinking many times in pastoral counseling. If someone says they want to go, uh, I don't know, do something very foolish like use heroin and one of the first things we say is, okay, and how has that worked out for other people? And the answer is it never works out well. Heroin never ends well. So we use teleological thinking. We as Christians are not unconcerned about consequences. But at the core of our theory, it is primarily deontological. Why? Because we believe an infinite, all-wise God has revealed himself both in the person of Jesus Christ and in Holy Scripture. The Protestant principle of sola scriptura differentiates the Protestant approach to deontological ethics from a Roman Catholic approach to this, to this degree. We are arguing that, first of all, all our virtues should be evaluated in light of Scripture and what does Scripture say about right and wrong. And in fact, virtues or correspond to deontological rules. And so the virtuous person is going to be a person who is cultivated a habit, a character of life, which seeks to, to follow after the rules which God has given. So deontolo deontology is not a system without problems. We tried to discuss a couple of those with the Euthyphro dilemma and then Kant's is ought dilemma, which he, excuse me, Hume's is ought dilemma, which Kant attempts to solve with the categorical imperative. But it, Christian ethics are primarily deontological. I will tell you that I've jokingly suggested several times that my problem as a Baptist ethicist is I have a marketing problem. When I tell people I use the Bible, they immediately get offended and don't want to hear what I have to say. So I've teasingly suggested that I should hang out my shingle somewhere in Hollywood with the sign, Alan Branch, Deontologist, Spiritual and Moral Advice from Ancient Parchments. And of course, the ancient parchments are the Holy Bible. But um, Perhaps that will give you something to think about, and these issues of deontology will be on the midterm exam. Our next uh, lecture will be talking about other aspects of normative ethics.